you know, it's inarguable the Apollo missions were, you know, if there is a, a sort of archetype of smart private public partnerships, amazing public policy, I think, you know, I think very few people would dispute its success simply because, you know, the mission was accomplished. But I, I suppose I've got a question, which is to what extent is it transferable to various contexts? So you can see how that works in a sort of a geopolitical rivalry context. You know, there's the United States and the Soviet Union, you're trying to get somewhere first. But in something like housing, you know, there are entrenched interests which don't really want to solve the housing crisis um, because the status quo suits them. Or, or perhaps more, you know, com- sort of easily understood, you know, climate change. There are massive hydrocarbon companies. There are massive consumer lobbies or even, you know, the car lobby, taxi, uh, you know, taxis in London are a major sort of, actually London cabs basically want to be a price cartel. There are major interests which you might agree with them, you might disagree with some of them, but that's a bit different to the Apollo missions in so much as it's about competing interests rather than, you know, all of us want this one thing, let's push towards it together. Because that doesn't necessarily hold for climate change or for elderly care or for the housing crisis, does it? Yes. I mean, the book is not trying to unpick everything. What it's saying is we have lots of money out there being spent by governments in terms of procurement, By the way, procurement is a huge percentage of government budgets. You know, like in the UK, the whole innovation budget across government is 10 billion. Just the procurement budget of the Ministry of Transport is close to 40 billion. So four times the whole innovation budget across the government. So if you can transform things that governments are already doing, innovation Mm -hmm. policy budgets, um, industrial strategy budgets, procurement, uh, SME, small medium um, enterprise financing, and transform it to be more purpose-oriented. That's sort of what the book is really focusing on. However, I also spend a lot of time throughout the book, from the beginning to the end, reminding the reader that the kind of challenges we have today, which I do think we should always remember that we signed up to the SDGs, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, um, which broadly define some of the biggest challenges we have around poverty, around climate, around gender parity, and so on, you know, those challenges are what I call wicked. They're much more, they're much harder than going to the moon. Mm. That's why a colleague of mine, a wonderful academic um, at Columbia University, Richard Nelson, back in the 70s, he wrote a book called The Moon and the Ghetto, you know, basically saying, hold on a second, we just got to the moon and back and we, we still have ghettos? Why? And the answer is, is, is very deep. You know, partly we just haven't treated with the same level of urgency our social problems. But even when we have, remember Johnson's War on Poverty, um, it's, it's just so much harder because it requires everything you just mentioned, you know, political change, regulatory change, behavioral change. Uh, uh, fundamentally, a lot of the, again, issues that I talk about in the book about public-private, that's not a technical thing. That's about the social compact. Who negotiates that? Um, so, so, yes, it's hard. But I do think that the mission-oriented approach, focus more on that word, not so much on the moonshot. And I, in some ways I regret yeah. using that word because of how it was then bastardized, bastardized in the UK. And Dominic Cummings <laughs> had actually brought me into Downing Street uh, a year ago saying, love your stuff. We want to do it. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, they had already started designing their own way. And I kept saying, hold on, hold on, you're doing it wrong. But, you know, this, this concept of the moonshot makes one just kind of think potentially that this is a deterministic technocratic, you know, just spend a lot of money on science and somehow we're going to solve problems. That's not at all what I'm arguing. What I'm arguing is we need to put our social problems at the center of how we design our economy, (laughs) our society. Uh, We need to treat it with a level of urgency. We need leaders who prioritize it and can actually talk about it is in really ambitious ways. You know, had Kennedy, you know, Today's Kennedy said, we're going to fight climate change, not because it's easy, because it, but because it's hard. Yeah, that's a good start. Then tell us what else you're going to do, but at least start with that, right? It's not just going to be about a carbon tax. <laughs> um, what's interesting is that if you unpick all those different types of policies that I mentioned already exist, because the book is not actually about saying we need to spend more. It's about spend completely differently, invest differently. Mm-hmm. We probably also have to invest a lot more, but, you know, focus on the goals. So climate change is SDG 14 or life below water is SDG 13. If you can transform these broad challenges into really concrete goals, like um, this, by the way, these examples I'm giving you are in this report that I wrote before writing the book for Europe, arguing the European Commission that we needed a mission-oriented approach. It was voted on by the Parliament and the European Council. So now missions are now a, a legal instrument within the European Commission to help direct innovation policy, oops, sorry, towards big goals. 
um, those types of very concrete, sorry, those broad challenges need to be rendered more concrete. Like we're going to have 100 carbon neutral cities across a region, or we're going to get 90% of the plastic out of the ocean. And the key point I'm saying is mm. don't think of this as just a public or a private thing. A, don't think of it as just a sectoral area, right? This isn't just about renewable energy, say, with climate. If you're going to have a carbon neutral city, you're going to need investment, innovation, new collaborations in real estate and energy, in mobility systems and construction materials and the social sector and food and so on. And the main challenge, you know, and it is a bit of a nitty gritty point. So maybe some, you know, some people might say, all right, this is boring. But <laughs> to me, it is about changing capitalism. Redesign everything government does to foster that bottom up innovation to fuel activity towards that goal. Um, now, the fact that it also requires new incentives, including tax, right? We're still taxing today materials uh, less than we tax labor, right? If you want to reduce the material content of our economy, which is central to actually mm -hmm. reducing our carbon emissions, the tax system can help you incentivize that. If you have capital gains tax as low as it is right now, what is that incentivizing? Short-termism, right? You can just make money quickly. Uh, uh, by buying and selling existing assets. If you want to foster long-termism in the business sector, you need to, again, have a tax system that has things like the financial transaction tax, but also within capital gains is rewarding those who keep their investments for a longer time, say 10 years, not just two years. So, of course, the tax system is really central in all the social problems that we have. But that doesn't mean that we don't need an investment pathway and a new design of public-private partnerships and serious capability within government so they don't just outsource their brains to the private sector. And of course, we need a private sector that is less financialized, the topic of my previous book. But even that, why would that happen? We need incentives for that. You know, one of the reasons why we ended up back in the day with an extremely innovative private sector laboratory called Bell Labs, many books have been written about Bell Labs, it was fundamental to the IT revolution, globally, is government actually created an incentive for AT&T mm -hmm. at the time to retain their monopoly status. They had to, to retain that contract, reinvest their profits into the real economy, into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. Bell Labs was the answer. Imagine today if we had that, you know, if we had requirements that any company, whether it's big pharmaceutical companies or big energy companies and so on, that receive public benefits, whether it's a patent, which by the way is a contract that government gives you for 20 years, or accessing public resources like in the United States, $40 billion a year is given basically to uh, the ecosystem of health innovation for the private sector to benefit from, benefit from. Imagine if all of that kind of public subsidy, public investment, public bailouts, which we have more and more of, were conditional on profits, A, being reinvested back into the economy as opposed to extract it out to the financial sector, and B, invested towards helping you know, really important goals be met. Uh, the green transition, but also more inclusive economy in terms of you know, treat your workers well, pay your tax, and so on. And that's where I think COVID's been so refreshing in some ways, as tragic as it still is. We've seen some countries be much more ambitious in terms of the conditionalities on the bailouts. We didn't see this with the financial crisis. So France has created conditions for both the auto and the airline industry to access recovery funds if they reduce their carbon emissions, so airlines and autos. Um, Denmark and Austria have put conditions on you can't use tax havens <laughs> if you're going to access recovery mm. funds. Elizabeth Warren in the U.S. was arguing that companies receiving uh, recovery funds wouldn't be able to just use you know, their funds on share buybacks, which you might know have just escalated massively in the last decade. Four trillion dollars have been used by the top global companies just to buy back their shares to boost stock options and executive pay. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but none of these dysfunctions in our capitalist system like <clears throat> ultra financialization are inevitable. They've been allowed to happen. Create conditionalities in order to really foster the building back better or the stakeholder capitalism agenda that the World Economic Forum likes to talk about, that is not going to happen if it's just up to one's own free will. It has to be nested within the design of the partnerships in the ecosystem. And interestingly, the Apollo program has you know, lessons on that. It wasn't about the technology necessarily. It was about mm -hmm. the partnership.